Okay, welcome back. And we're going to keep going on this journey through chapter 19. So this section deals with population growth and regulation because depending on what type of organism is and how the population grows, you're going to see different trends start to happen. So that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to see that there's going to be some similarities that we're going to bring into when we start talking about human population growth later on. So why study it? What's the point of studying population growth? Well, it helps us make predictions about future changes in population size. So I'm a huge planner. So if I can make sure and be prepared for certain things, that's what I want to do. And there's certain people out there that love to do that. So if we know that a population is going to be increasing, so maybe we need to make sure that we have enough resources for them, depending on what we're growing. And if we see changes, maybe there are things that we can do to probably prevent it from further declining. So example over here, um, if we see a, a population of salmon in a stream dying a lot, but we have no idea why. So let's think about the different reasons that could be causing that. Um, is it being overfished? You know, um, are we removing more than what is able to be um, produced? Uh, is the habitat declining? Um, is there something about the water? Are the increasing in ocean temperatures causing fertility problems? That is actually um, a big thing people really haven't thought about yet, but temperature, a lot of organisms rely on temperature when it comes to certain cues and for uh, reproduction, and that could actually cause some problems. Or is it a combination of all of these? So these are one things why we study population. Now, we can also address problems with when we're starting to see biodiversity diversity decrease and maybe step in before it gets too late and we can also use it to better understand how these organisms interact with you with each other so let's talk about some of the patterns that we're going to see now the first big one is called exponential growth and you'll see this one and because it relates directly to human population so this graph is just showing you over time over here on the bottom and we have human population size in billions here on the side and you can see over time, boom, 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 you know, human population, it was going up slightly, but not much. We have this dip right here where we had the plague, boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden, it just took off. Think about all that changed in these times. Um, we got better, more sterile tex techniques, advanced in technology, advanced in industrialization. So many things have led to this increase in population. This is called exponential growth. With this, there's no limit to growth. As long as resources, resources are available, this will keep shooting up. Now, bacterial growth, um, if you remember back to me talking about bacteria, um, this is a little video showing you how you can go with a doubling time. Remember, I talked about a generation within 20 minutes. So this is just a reminder. So if you see this J-shaped curve, that is a good indicate that that is a population that is experience, experiencing exponential growth. But how do we measure growth rates? So as I remember, you're going to have to account for both the death and the birth, birth rate. So we do the change in number over the change of time, and that's going to be equal to our birth rate minus our death rate. So we combine that into what we have is our one factor, which is called R. And depending if it's a positive or negative, uh, the population is changing. As I mentioned before, you can have zero population growth. So this is a, a graph um, measuring the population, showing the birth rate and um, death rate for China. And it kind of links to the one-child policy that they enacted and they later um, took back. But what they were noticing with that is like, okay, Boom, boom, boom. We had an increase in death rate, and then it kind of plateaued out. But they were noticing that, okay, the death rate wasn't increasing, but the birth rate had this huge increase. So the overall population was increasing a lot at this time because the death rate really wasn't increasing, but the population birth rate was. So that's when they enacted the one child policy, and there's actually a video, I think, on it in the next um, lecture. So the first one was exponential. The second type of growth you can see is called logistic growth. Now this is where the population is going to grow until the resources become limited. So it kind of link it with that struggle for existence. Now what you're going to 
see it's going to go right here and then it's going to rapidly increase and then it's slowly going to curve off. Now what's happening, it's reaching what's called the carrying capacity. So that's the maximum population that an environment can like sustain. You know, we can't have more than that. That's maximum resources. We can't bring anyone else in. Um, now, when that happens, we're going to have more competition for resources. So depending on what this carrying capacity will determine where this curve eventually plateaus out. So you kind of see this curve look more like an S shape compared to the J. And if you love math, here is the popular or the formula that is used to actually calculate the carrying capacity. So one of the things we actually talk about is there's different ways that the carrying capacity will change. Um, different seasons, um, especially think about winter, places that have extreme summers and winters and stuff. Natural disasters can really impact that. You don't think about it, but then they can suddenly wipe out a whole area and, and you know, now the populations are going to have to adjust. Now there's different types of um, ways that are being regulated. Um, there's going to be this interspecific competition between populations because they don't exist in isolation. We're going to be competing for the same resources, and I always put that out with in last out last right here because, you know, if you can adapt and get the resources for someone else, your species is going to survive, and theirs is not. Now we do have different types of regulation. There's the density dependent, so this is more biological. And it all comes down to the density of population. And you'll see different populations depending on how they interact with each other. Um, the predator-prey relationship, and we'll see that in another lecture, um, inter- and intraspecies competition, how parasites work. Basically, the densities and affect the growth rate and mortality. So if you're more dense, you're going to have a higher mortality rate because if something happens, it's going to wipe out everyone, and then that will lead to a higher rate. Now, if it's independent, these are going to be more physical. So this is where Mother Nature comes and rears her ugly head. So this can be due to weather or natural disasters. Our pollution. So mortality sorry, is going to happen regardless of the density. So this one depends on the concentration. This one is going to happen regardless. It could care less about how dense your population is. So another thing that they like to talk about in this section is um, how species adapt and evolve to specific adaptations. So we don't account for limited resources or competition, but more about reproductive strategies, their habitat, and how they care for their young. So this, depending on the type of species, will determine if it's going to fall into what we call a K-selected species or an R-selected species. Now, the K ones, they're going to have larger but fewer offspring. So when that happens, they have to do a large amount of resources to each offspring. So think about an elephant. All right, she's going to have one calf, and it's going to take a lot of effort and help with the herd and a lot of resources to bring that calf up to uh, adult age. Now, these will exist closer to their carrying capacity because they're having to devote so many resources to that. Now, these survive best in stable, predictable environments because, you know, a sudden change is harder to adapt to. We fall into this category, too. Now, the opposite is what we call these R-selected species, where they have large number of offspring. Your marine invertebrates, plants fall into this category, too. They produce a large number of seeds, and to get those started off early does not take a large amount of resources. Now, I'm not saying that all of them are going to survive, so if you remember this different curves, these are probably going to have a high mortality rate early on and less of a chance of making to adulthood. But the one thing about these species, they can adapt easily to unstable and unpredictable environments. So that is all I have for this section. So here's some review videos and then credit, there it is, for the slides.